I've often said that I wished people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame and, so that they could see that it's not where you're going to find your sense of completion. I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Welcome back. Uh, today I am coming at you from the outskirts of Kuchan in Hokkaido. And this gentleman sitting right next to me is none other than Trevor Ponting. Uh, everyone calls him Trev. Welcome to Short Stories, Trev. Hi, uh, Jay. How long you been hanging out in uh, Kuchan for? Oh, I've been here since uh, early 90s. Um, stayed because the snow was incredible and uh, just was the place to be. So living here now with my uh, wife Aiko and uh, two children, Mia and uh, Toa. And uh, Toa's one, Mia's three. And uh, yeah, been enjoying the, the Japanese summer because uh, COVID has been making it tricky to get home. And <laughs> uh, enjoying the Japanese summer and looking forward to the winter. And uh, we've got a El Nino 30 year storm coming. Um, at this stage, there's no bookings for the town here. There's going to be no lift lines and some of the best snow daily in the world. So why would you leave? <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. It's going to be uh, basically um, the sort of silver li lining in what's been a difficult year, right? Yeah, it's been a difficult year for me. Uh, oh, I, oh, going on six months ago, um, seven months ago now, I was uh, diagnosed with brain cancer. Mm. And uh, Heavy. learning that uh, in Sapporo, um, an hour and a half north from here was one of the best hospitals in the world to be to treat brain cancer. So uh, um, um, forced me to stay. Um, the doctor was saying in the next several months, if I don't go down the road with him, I uh, could die any day in the next several months. So he said, pack your bags, come back to hospital, and when you come back, you don't leave until I say you do. So, as which I, which I did, and uh, went in for tumor reduction surgery, and uh, thirty two days of radiotherapy after that, and then following chemotherapy, and uh, and I've just been living with brain cancer since that day, and uh, getting on with it. I uh, came out of hospital, back to rock climbing, and back to being a dad, my kids, and a husband, and my wife living here in Mexico. Well, that's certainly the best outcome, Trev. I, I remember coming to visit you several months um, uh, after the operation, and um, I was preparing, you know, for uh, for the worst, um, and you blew me away. You were uh, you were getting near the end of your stay, but y your spirits were so good, and, and you'd been working really hard on your on your recovery, and um, I remember just leaving, like, like with a, a great sense of hope, and so happy. That, that you'd push through this, this like, geez, it's one of the most difficult things people can deal with. Sure. But happy sure. to have you here, mate. Anyway, we're here to talk about snowboarding, but thanks for sharing that story with us, mate, and I, and I'm, and I wish sure you thing, the, yeah, I wish okay. you a continued uh, recovery, mate. Yep. Um, I'd like to stick to the, the, the sort of questions we've done on the other episodes. Um, sure. So my first question, Trev, um, is do you remember the moment that you knew snowboarding was becoming the thing for you? Was there one particular day where you were like, oh, here we go? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's a blur now because we're <laughs> going back. We're going back into, uh, uh, I guess, uh, the early 90s. Woo! And uh, snowboarding wasn't something. I, I got asked if I would like to try snowboarding by um, Mark and Bill from Cheapskates Christchurch. And... At that stage, I hadn't really looked at snowboarding or skiing as a sport that uh, I would really um, aspire to do. Um, but there was offers to do it. Uh, Cheapskates was a um, kind of a light sponsor of mine for skateboarding, and, and they knew that I was a board sports person, so they gave me um, an offer to, to, for some higher boards and rental boards to use. Uh, to go snowboarding if I wanted to 
It wasn't until I uh, met a personality called uh, Roy Hawthorne, uh, Roy Boy from uh, New Zealand, um, who was one of the uh, one of the first snowboarders that I ever seen snowboarding, and one of the most talented uh, New Zealand snowboarders of the day. And uh, he uh, he and I we met uh, through street skating in Christchurch, and. The, one of the first days that I ever went snowboarding, I looked up the hill and I seen a guy pulling a tailbone method and watched him from when he landed the jump to the bottom of the hill and it was Roy Boy. Yeah. And uh, he uh, started giving me rides to the hill and, uh, and uh, taught me a lot about snowboarding in a way and... Uh, he was uh, one of the better riders in Mount Hutt at the time and still to the day. Mean. And uh, he made things a lot more possible for a uh, for a young young kid from Brighton, Christchurch, to get to the hill. Great. So. Well, that answers my question because um, when I first uh, met you um, in the early two thousands, you were a methan. So so you're actually in Brighton at this point in Christchurch, skating skating all the time. You've got you've yep. got quite the legendary. Uh, uh, skate status from a group of people I know, um, and so but you you met him at Mount Hutt. I met Roy in Christchurch street skating. Okay. Um, he had uh, recently moved down from uh, the North Island. Okay. Uh, with his brother, I believe at the time they were living in a van and touring around, and he was doing a bit of skating at uh, at Hagley High School, which is um, a high school in uh, Christchurch, which. Uh, did a deal with the council to uh, give the council land to build the one of the first public skate parks. Um, yeah, big ups Hagley. In Christchurch, yeah, big ups Hagley. And uh, so he was there skating one day and I offered to take him around Christchurch, show him some street skating spots and uh, it paid off dividends because uh, <laughs> he ended up giving me a ride to the um, to Mount Hutt. Uh, um, my father would drop me off in the square at... Uh, in Christchurch and uh, and I'd meet Roy and Roy would give me a ride from uh, Christchurch Central up to the mountain. Cool. And uh, and did do for um, most of the rest of that season. Cool. Um, so uh, Mount Hutt, um, for those that don't know, is uh, one of the major ski fields in the South Island. One of the one of the big five, would you say? And um, it's what about an is it about an hour from Christchurch? From memory? Yeah, Mount Hutt's out uh, an hour from Christchurch. Yeah, and it's beautiful. And it's the, you can see the ocean when you're up there, and then you can see all the farmers' fields that look like patchwork quilt, mm, right? Yeah. I, re- I remember the first time I went there, I was just like, "Wow!" Yeah. Um, does have one of the gnarliest, axiest roads um, ever uh, from memory. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's been a while since I've been there, but a great ski field. Yeah, it's one of the main uh, main commercial ski fields in South Island. And uh, predominantly gets, um, on average, uh, the most snow each season, mm. uh, which is one of the reasons why I carried on living there. Yeah. Uh, in the early day, I, uh, I had seasons in Wanaka and uh, dabbled in Queenstown, but the amount of snow that Mount Hutt got and uh, opening first and uh, closing last out of all the commercial fields, uh, decided uh, to... To keep living there. When did you move to Methven? So I moved to Methven the year, I believe it was, what was it, 93. Well, okay, cool. Yeah. Methven's a small town at the base of Mount Hutt, right? Yeah. Farming so, community, would you call it, is that, is that why it's there? Yeah, it's a it's a farming community and um, and the service town to Mount Hutt. Yeah. And uh, Great spot. Yeah, it's a... Um, the Blue Pub, is it? Was the Blue Pub. Yeah. There's like two bars in the whole of town. It's a very small town, a quieter town uh, than uh, Wanaka or Queenstown. Yeah. And um, it uh, has less people and uh, the housing and accommodation, rent, and um, uh, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah, and hallelujah. So... so- so that kind of leads into the next question. What changes once you realised that you were, you know, that Roy had inspired you, that, that snowboarding was going to be a thing? What changes did you make in your life? To, to, did you make changes to focus on snowboarding? 
ah, yeah, well, it was basically I'd become friends with uh, a bunch of other guys which were right in at Mount Hutt mm-hmm. um, and uh, Quentin Robbins oh. and uh, a few of his a few of his best friends and uh, and then his dad um, offered me a spot in the car to give me rides uh, weekends Saturday Sunday so he'd, uh, yeah, you get your father to drop you off at my house and I'll take you to Mount Hutt. Awesome. Uh, Saturday, Sunday for five bucks. So after that, I was no longer doing one day a week on mm. the leopard bus. <laughs> um, spending all my pocket money on the leopard bus to get up there one day a week. I was getting up there Saturday, Sunday, sometimes more. And, uh, and so I was getting up there a lot more. Great. So, uh, cheers to Colin Robbins, Quentin Robbins' father. Oh, and I'd, I'd like Qu- Quentin Robbins was my first hero uh, when I was into snowboarding. I, I first met him in '96. Didn't know who he was. Sat on a che- got on a chair with him, and um, and I think Dil Butt as well. And uh, I was my normal talkative self. And uh, they thought they must have thought this would be funny. Let's go snowboarding with this. Uh, let's go on the line of the new guy. And they said, can we go with you? And I was like, oh, yeah. I just thought they were two other nice, friendly dudes, right? And then I, I, I hit this one little jump. For me, it was on the side. And I pulled down and stopped to see, to watch them come down. And they went over the much bigger one through the middle. And just, I'd never seen anyone do anything like that, ever. And I just went, oh, my God. These guys are the most amazing snowboarders I've ever seen. And I was like, um... What was your name again? <laughs> and uh, that's when I first met Q. And he, yeah, and him and Dylan inspired me a lot. So, um, man, what an awesome um, guy to go snowboarding with in the early days. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, um, he was my main partner on crime back then. Uh, definitely the first season in uh, in in Miffin. And uh, yeah, I said to Quint, um, next year we should leave school, leave home and move to the mountain and just snowboard every day. And so uh, the next winter was approaching and I got a phone call. I'd uh, I'd kind of forgotten about snowboarding a little bit uh, through summer, back to skating and and, uh, and hadn't seen Quentin for the summer. And I get a phone call. Were you serious? I said, were you serious about what? And he says... <laughs> Leaving home, leaving school, and going snowboarding every day, and uh, I said, "Yeah, sounds like a good idea." It's he bowled around in his mini, and we filled the gas tank up twice to get out to Miffin, or the radiator up twice to get out to Miffin. <laughs> went out there, went around a bunch of houses trying to find a flat. People were, like looking at us, laughing. We were like little dreads and snowboard wear and looking like little park rats and the rural town of Miffin was like you got to be joking <laughs> and uh, we went to a backpacker and the backpacker said uh, I have a bus in the in the paddock across the road from the backpacker you can live in it for 50 bucks each sweet or 50 bucks a week yeah so Queen and I changed that bus into a house and moved in and uh infiltrated the town of Meffin. <laughs> Sounds awesome. So was that 94? That was 93. 93. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. so, so you'd already been snowboarding for a little bit and this is your first proper season and that's when things go whoomph, right? Yeah, I think uh, um, first season was at school. Bunked every day at school to go snowboarding as much as possible and did maybe 50 days. Yeah, and uh, the next season uh, moved to Miffin. Yeah, and Q and I did 125 days. Yeah, wicked. And that was it. It was just they were snowboarding every day. Did you shoot any photos in those days? Shot a few. Get started. Shot a few photos. Yeah. Um, uh, Fur Erickson was also um, Fur Erickson, the uh, owner of New Zealand Snowboarder. He yeah, was also. From Brighton, where I came from, and a couple of the older older um, friends of my brother mm-hmm. knew Phil, and said, "Oh, how about trip on him? You know, like he's getting good at snowboarding. Why don't you shoot some photos of him?" 
so Phil, um, uh, we we did a few shoots and um, oh, was it with Stan Hill? We did a sh- Quinn and I did a shoot with Stan Hill mm-hmm. and uh, the and Quentin Quentin got the cover. Yeah. Of uh, of New Zealand snowboarder. Free, free riding. Yeah. Free ride freestyle. Yeah, we were yeah. just uh, in a paddock, um, in a paddock with a little bit of a hill, doing some turns, and uh, and Quinn got the pow- got the cover. Nice. Yeah, powder shot. And uh, so shortly after that, uh, I think it was uh, in '95. No, would be '95. '94. I'm making you go back a bit, mate. Sorry. Yeah, '94, I guess. Um, I was I was living in Wanaka and um, and got the call from Phil uh, and Steen Webster to uh, come and do a shoot at Temple Basin and uh, mm-hmm. so we did a road trip from Wanaka with Steen and uh, all the way down to Temple Basin and did about a five day five day mission to Temple Basin where we shot a bunch of shots and. Uh, so I ended up getting the cover of New Zealand Snowboarder. Is that your first cover? It was my first cover. I had a maybe another cover of a local rag, a skate rag from uh, Christchurch. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was my uh, my first my first big big shot. Nice and, one. Uh, and pursue, uh, after that, got uh, many other shot in New Zealand Snowboarder magazines and uh, yeah, covers. Yeah, I remember, I remember and, seeing uh, you. Uh, a couple of contest pages and a few fast forwards and uh, various various photos through uh, New Zealand Snowboarder, Dang. which helped with uh, sponsors and and. Uh, oh, it just helped you go snowboarding more, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, free gear, sponsors, free gear, um, making it easy to get to the hill. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear, I, I hear that. That's awesome. Um, next question, mate. So now you've been snowboarding for a bit. Um, obviously, but if you're getting covers, uh, what did snowboarding teach you about yourself? Did it did it reveal anything? <laughs> well, coming out of Brighton, Christchurch, it was a pretty rough town, and taught me how to calm down a bit and get along with the kids from the hill, and and uh, basically uh, snowboarding um, gave me the tools to travel. And uh, having the tools to travel, uh, you know, traveling gives you a lot of life lessons. Yeah, exactly, and, bro. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's where snowboarding changed my life a lot. Um, Me too. It's great. So uh, yeah, anyone out there having a hard time in life, go traveling. We'll sort you out. <laughs> Once we freaking can. Um, speaking <laughs> of traveling, so so. Um, Obviously, we all become uh, we all become uh, inadvertent travellers through snowboarding, and um, yeah, travelling really uh, opened my mind too, bro. I, I just I love it. Um, and uh, in, is there a place in your travels that exceeded your expectations? Is there one place in particular when you you were like, whoa, this place? Well, Japan was uh, was probably that place. Mm-hmm. Um, Japan the. Um, People um, were nice, uh, always friendly, polite. Um, just uh, Japan doesn't really have a, uh, a bad element. No, pa- um, paperwork. They love their paperwork here, yeah, mate. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not really a bad element, is it? Yeah, it's just a thing. Um, I guess, I guess Japan was the first place that really changed me in a lot of ways. Um, it was a place where I could relax and um, it's definitely peaceful and uh, be at peace. Um, yeah, it's uh, the powder was uh, therapeutic. Um, just the amount of it. There's a difference between now traveling mm. and and. Uh, and back then, um, what would that be? Well, basically, people don't leave their home unless they have a visa, a job to go to, someone to pick them up, 
a house to move to a security. Okay. They don't go out of their bubble. Yeah. They don't go out of their security. Um, so these days what I've seen in young kids, you know, working with Holiday Nisiko, you, you meet all the different kids that come in to uh, work for the seasonal seasonal staff and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, and you basically you're picking them up from the airport or from the bus station and you're taking them to the accommodation and here's your season pass and here it all is laid out to you just like that the dream and and I think kids these days if they didn't have that they wouldn't go okay that's a fair point so if they didn't have someone to pick them up at the other end um if they didn't have um that person to pick them up a combination sorted um everything sorted they probably wouldn't go but in my day, it was a phone number in my pocket. I leave Christchurch with one phone number of a guy that I met in Vancouver. He came to New Zealand and says, here's my number. And I never knew at that stage that I was going to go to Canada. Mm-hmm. So my, um, my first place I ever wanted to travel to was Vancouver, Canada. Mm-hmm. Reading scabled mags. You see the ramps with Vancouver written across the top of the bear ramp. And that's the place I always wanted to go. So I managed to get some money and had enough money to go overseas. I had an offer to go to Japan. You come to Japan, make you a superstar. The guy was willing to pay for our airfares and uh, pick us up and uh, travel us. But at the stage... I had enough money, so I went to Vancouver, the place mm-hmm. I always wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So I bypassed um, going to Japan, the first opportunity that I did, and I went to Vancouver. I pulled up in that airport, I pulled out that one phone number I had in my pocket, and rung a guy that didn't even know I was coming, and said, hey mate, it's Trevor Ponding here from New Zealand, I met you in New Zealand, um, would you have a place for me to crash? Uh, he says, do you snowboard? I said, yeah, he's got your snowboard gear with you. I said, yeah, I've got my board bag here in the hot, in the uh, airport. He says, I'm going to this mountain right now. I'll pick you up in an hour. <laughs> I said, righto. So he pulls into the airport, chuck my board bag in the back of his ute, big Canadian truck. Yeah, as they, as they have. And we went to Cyprus Bowl. Yeah, just, yeah. Bought just a season pass. Right there, right then, went snowboarding for the day with Adam, and uh, he put me up on his couch for the next few weeks before another friend said I've got a room at his house to yeah. rent, and I did my first season in Vancouver City, and uh, epic seasons pass at Cypress Bowl, road trips to Whistler, road trips to Mount Baker, um, and punk shows and skating in Vancouver City uh, awesome yeah it's a great story yeah. mate yeah. isn't Canada great the, f- the first place I ever went mate ever overseas oh. was Canada Epic. Canada was Canada was amazing it was uh, I went to Green Day's first show <laughs> you know like here's no effects big show and they're going, right, we've got some guys coming out now. It's Green Day. It's their first big show. And it was just punk shows every week. And uh, and skating and, and punk shows and, and no effects. Playing every week. Going to going to big shows at the ballroom in uh, Vancouver. Uh, seeing Sepultra. Um, was it Sepultra, Biohazard. And Fear Factory, all in one show. Mean. Just amazing. And then snowboarding, places like Mount Baker and Whistler and, and Cypress Bowl. Uh, just, you know. How, how did you go from our relatively small fields of Mount Hart to you're at Mount Baker? Did you did you find did you find um, an easy switch for you? Was it like a no-brainer or, or was it difficult? Yeah, well, it was, you know, when you're riding the club fields, you know, like... Mepham was my town, and you'd follow the storms from 
Mount Hutt through the club fields and uh, and Craigie Burn and Broken River and stuff Port like this. Porter Heights. Porter Heights, uh, Temple Basin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, Mount Baker was... Relatively uh, small ski fields, right? It was maybe some days a bit more powder than we were used to, but, uh, you know, it was... New Zealand ski fields set you up for everything in the world. And, and uh, but I was uh, meeting up guys at the ski fields, uh, overseas uh, professional riders, and mm-hmm. and sometimes joining, having chair rides with them and riding with them just by chance, and uh, and started to realise that I at this stage I was I was actually snowboarding with some of the best guys in the world, and then holding my own. It was it was it was early days. It was ninety three. Um, and uh, yeah, so I opened my eyes that we, you know, from New Zealand, you could you could do it if you yeah. wanted to. Yeah, and and we're and we're blessed to have that skateboarding background because I come from that as well, and so of course that just once I learned the basics of left right stop with my edges, then it was like right, how can I snowboard? How can I skateboard on this mountain? And and that gives us such a wonderful. Um, like platform or foundation to launch from and, and, and then I mean that's obviously it's just what I like so it's what I look for in other snowboarders but for me it tends to shine a, a bit you know you can when someone's skateboarding the mountain you, 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 you know you get people's attention and you're just having fun right? <laughs> yeah that was the, that was the difference between uh, myself and, and a few of the other guys I was riding with uh, in those early days we were all just skate rats yeah, and uh, so we stood out on the mountain, and and uh, makes for good photos too. Yeah, I was a junior, junior half pipe champ skating in Christchurch, and mm-hmm. so snowboarding half pipe was just an extension of that, and it was just yeah easier. Would would you agree? I found half yeah. pipe on the snowboard you're strapped to your feet. Yeah, <laughs> a lot easier, a lot <laughs> a thousand easier. times easier, right? Yeah, and softer landings. <laughs> um, travel tips I always like to give people th- just just three travel tips it doesn't have to be about snowboarding mm. just three three things that you would never that you do when you travel travel tips sometimes unplanned travelling is the best travelling yep I agree uh, yeah some a lot of my later travels have been uh planned and and with um teams of uh guys and uh but uh sometimes the unplanned trip can be as good as the planned trip so sometimes you just got to throw your stuff in the bag and go and uh for me traveling has always been about skate parks yeah you just go to the skate park and meet other people other skaters and uh, a little bit harder now because there's not skate parts everywhere there is snowboarding and uh, but for me in the early days uh, traveling around New Zealand hitchhiking to places trying to skate it was just go to the skate park meet other skaters find a couch to crash yeah and uh, like a family yeah I've had many of those experiences at New Zealand and New Zealand and overseas yeah, just no, meet someone at the skate park. Those people always show you the way and the places to be. So, yeah, big up skateboarders around the world. Yeah, the brothers and sisters. Um, so, what does snowboarding mean for you, Trev? I know it's I know that's a kind of a deep question, but but hmm. what does it what does it mean? Especially after all these years. First thing that comes to mind, freedom. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's just an unwritten book, you know. You, you you get off with it, no matter how you get to the top of the mountain, whether it be a chair or a um, or um, snowshoes or uh, or you hike. Whatever you do, you get to the top of the hill. You look down. It's an open book. Mm-hmm. Anywhere you want to go, it's up to you. Um, there's no boundaries. Um, yeah, snowboarding is just freedom and then in the creativity of what you can do on a snowboard, which is uh, boundless. And uh, yeah, it's uh, 
also uh, destruction. <laughs> Beautiful chaos. <laughs> yeah, it's like the amount of force and the amount of um, energy that you can exert into snowboarding is is just a freedom. Uh, you go down a a thing that's made by nature beautifully made brand new every day wind lips sculptured waves and you can go down and smash it to complete bits <laughs> and tomorrow Satisfied, right? <laughs> it will be brand new yep and you don't have to fix it yourself <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really good answer Trev it's a great way of looking at it Th- throwing buckets <laughs> Yeah, I like I, you know, I, I love those. You see that pristine wind lip, and the, the, and your only thought is lip slide, like so, bang, you know, he's gone. When I first rode here, you were riding a windy day in Niseko, Japan, and you're flying down, you're smashing wind lips, completely destroying wind lips. Look back, and all you see is a huss of spray, <laughs> and you go up the chair, and you come down the next run. And it's brand new. And it's looking at you saying, come on, what you got this time? <laughs> it's a great answer, dude. Smash what me. else can you do that? I think I think surfing and riding deep powder is a very close cousin. Mm. And uh, But when there's something so pristine as a wind lip and it's there, something made by the wind and, and the snow overnight, and you smash it to absolute bits... You can see your destruction. Mm. And then to go back up a chair on a windy day, see that brand new again, staring you at the face, laughing at you pretty much, (laughs) and be able to smash that again, that's a beautiful thing. (laughs) It is a beautiful thing, Trev. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Moving forward, what's important to you now? Family, Mm. kids, getting well. Getting back on this train. Getting back to who I was before brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And being able to do all the things I've been talented at in the past. And getting those talents back. But most of all family, kids. And they're the things that have given me the the power to face my uh, illness. and, uh, And to... Put the gloves on and fight every day as hard as you can to regain your life. So, family. Awesome, bro. The final. Hey, um, you know people love to give advice and heaps of times you're like, yep, thanks, great. But every now and then, someone gives you a bit of advice and it works for you. And you're like, damn, that was a great piece of advice. Well, have, you, have you got a best piece of advice someone ever gave you that you'd like to share with everyone? Uh, I would say always listen. A lot of people talk a lot, but not a lot of people listen properly. All the things I've ever learned have always been taught by an older and more experienced person. And the reason why I've learned those things it's because I've listened. If you're always talking, then it's hard to listen. Mm, that's a wise, those are wise words, mate. Something I had to learn myself, being the talker. <laughs> I had to learn the power of the power of listening. And uh, by no means that is not personal. No, of course you. not, Trev. I'm, I'm cool. That is something <laughs> that I tell uh, young people. <laughs> it's a great bit of advice, mate. Great bit of advice. Now, um, my last question I like to ask is, what's the most epic random thing that happened? And you talked about this a little bit when you talked about traveling, like everything's planned. But sometimes you do an unplanned thing, and something epic happens that mm. just the universe just like it, like like everything falls into place, yeah. like getting dealt a primo hand at cards, and you're like, oh, wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Do you have do you have a, do you have a story for that? I've got a I've got a good one, but um, but I can't talk about it. It's gonna be on the internet, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, do 
Yeah, randomly. What about a Japan story? Did you did you go somewhere you hadn't been before? And it turned out to be an all time. Um Oh, and it doesn't have to be snowboarding, mate. It can be in or skating. Did you end up skateboarding at the big day out? Cause, cause, yeah, I did. Yeah, that's what I thought you might have. Yeah, I skated at the big day out. And, and I you skated with Tony. And exactly. And... Yeah, I would have been in the crowd. Yeah. In Auckland? I went to every single one, bro. I would, yeah. I would have been watching you. Yeah, well... Curtis, um, Osborne, Curtis Osborne would have been... Did you know Curtis? Yeah. Yeah, so Curtis was my brother's best mate. Yeah. My younger brother's best mate. So knowing... Um, I was going to be skating in the um, Big Day Out demo. Yeah. And um, and knowing that Danny Way was going to be there skating as well, I, I was like, mm -hmm. I've got to have a question. I can't just rock up to him and go, Ooh. <laughs> you know? Fair now. I had to have a question for him to talk about on the platform. I knew I was going to be standing there next to him. Yeah. Him dropping in, I'm dropping in. And if I want to talk to this guy who's like, one of the biggest all-time heroes of your life. Go. Um, you can't just rock up to him and go, oh, you know, I needed a question. So I thought about a question. My question was, Danny, uh, where did you learn frontside rodeos? Was it on the skateboard ramp or was it on the snowboard? Yeah, I know a, you're a good snowboarder. Yeah, he was a pro snowboarder, I think. Sort of. He was kind of a pro snowboarder on Type 8. And he said to myself, and this was his words, he said, on my skateboard, because I suck on a snowboard. <laughs> he wasn't. And I was like, really? It's like, humble. I've, I've seen some photos on Type A and rah, rah, rah. Yeah, me too. But he, he said, yeah, no, he, he learned frontside rodeos on his skateboard first. And uh, which we uh, ended up talking away and, and then... Uh, when we're standing on the platform, he actually looked at me like a, like another um, another guy on the deck, and uh, and uh, wasn't shooing me away like a little grommet, and I was like, cool, I pulled it off. <laughs> Get on you, mate. And uh, so that was pretty cool to That's skate it. with. Uh, I think Colin McKay, uh, Danny Way, myself. Some other Kiwi guys, uh, Andrew Morrison would have been there. Marie. Um, yeah. And, uh, Was and, Lee Ralph there? And I'd say Lee Ralph is definitely there. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can remember Lee being there. Shout out to and Lee I Ralph. And I was like, I want to talk to Danny Way, but I'm not going to go up as a grommet and go, can I have your autograph? I wanted to go up to him and ask him a question, a proper question. So that was my question. Good on you, mate. Where do you learn frontside rodeos? So the Big Day Outs, ladies and gentlemen, were um, a series of all-day music festivals, which are quite normal now, but back in the 90s they were a new thing. And we got to see all our favourite um, uh, American bands. Uh, and it was in the middle of summer. It was in January. Uh, middle of summer in New Zealand. And they'd put a vert ramp in the back of the, in the, back of the st uh, stadium. And um, Tony Hawk and his mates would come down, and so we'd get to hear our favourite bands and you just had to turn around and you could watch New Zealand legends and international legends just jam. It, was, it wasn't a comp. They just jammed on a vert ramp. It was so epic. And it was... Uh, I'm not surprised you were one of them. Yeah, it was, it was an annual pilgrimage for uh, uh, my friend Raphael Deutsch and I. Mm -hmm. And uh, so every summer, the big day out would come. And uh, we'd get offered some tickets to go up to the big day out and skate. So uh, we'd hitchhike from Christchurch all the way to the, to Auckland. It's a long and, way. Uh, and get get to the festival and show up at the gate. And sometimes the tickets were there and sometimes they weren't. But we'd somehow get into the festival and make it onto that ramp. And uh, at this stage in New Zealand there wasn't... A lot of vert skaters so there was only so many guys which would skate and uh and we'd we, yeah we'd hitch up to auckland and get the big day out and get onto that vert ramp and skate with some of the best in the world uh steve caballero tony hawk danny way colin mckay um oh, the list goes on yeah. all the legends of new zealand lee ralph and andrew morrison and uh my friend Raphael Deutsch and I would uh, 
would be standing across on the platform away from each other and looking at each other going, yeah, this is the one, this is it. It was a cool day, man. <laughs> I, I, I went to all of them. And that? it was always the best place to watch the bands play because yeah. you're up on the platform of the Burt Ramp and you're looking right across the top of the whole crowd yeah. and you're just dropping in, dropping bombs and and, uh, and uh, skating as good as you could. And it was always... You go to the big day out demos, and you come away skating way better than, than what you did because you the people that you were skating with. Yeah, for sure. And uh, all time jams. It was, it was just something that we had to go to every summer. Yeah. And uh, we'd do everything we could to get there every season. And, yeah, I never uh, missed one, bro. Epic days. Yeah. Except that one time it yeah. rained like crazy and <laughs> flooded the stadium. But yeah. let's not. Let, I, I prefer to block that that one out of my memory yeah. it was a dark one yeah. <laughs> yeah rage against the machine we're in rage all against time machine. Though. never seen anything like that right holy moly sheets Up. of plywood floating across <laughs> crowds of people in the rain with yeah. nails hanging out of them yeah with stage divers jumping from one sheet to the other yeah it literally Madness. rained like the, the the stadium had like a foot of water right like yeah. it was insane yeah. it was you've never said just it, it can rain in New Zealand. Mate. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It's just insanity. Well, that's a, that's a good way to finish. Um, Trev, um, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing all of that with us. And um, we'll take a little break and uh, maybe we can talk about um, the Seiko. Is there anyone you want to thank, mate? Or any, like, like I know you've got your <laughs> offshore snow shapes here. here uh... Oh, too many people to thank. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to the sponsors. Offshore Snow Shapes, Oyuki, it's probably boards and gear, and uh, thanks to my family, and uh, my, my bros, my riding bros, uh, skateboarding bros, Craig Hurst, Raphael Deutsch, Quinn and Robbins, Roy Hawthorne, Jeremy Kidd, Neil Ziepler, all you guys. Can't wait to ride with you guys again. And it'll be soon. Get over this COVID-19 thing. Get those borders all open. we we'll start travelling when we want. Get back to the people and the places that we love. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah. But until then, El Nino, 30-year winter. Nisko Okado. Let's have it. Let's go. You. Mm-hmm. Thanks for watching, everybody. Big shout-outs to Trev, uh, Trev Ponting. And um, we'll be back, uh, hopefully, with the uh, Nisiko edition, Trev Ponting Part 2. And um, hopefully uh, there's going to be some Burton Japanese riders coming up during winter uh, that I hopefully get to talk to. We'll keep their name secret for now. but um, uh, And I may be going to China in February to MC the World Champs, uh, which is a dress rehearsal for the Olympics. And at this stage, it's still going ahead. So... Uh, Fingers crossed, but I'll, I'll let you know if uh, more information comes out about that. But um, yeah, see you soon.